Let's open our Bibles to the 24th chapter of Matthew. We're looking at Christ's promises and predictions. And when Jesus promises and predicts, it's going to happen. And that's why it's so wonderful to study this outline that Jesus gave us in the 24th chapter of what's next for planet Earth, what, what is coming. Because Jesus has written history. Uh, he has written the future in advance, written down exactly what it is that's going to happen. And the question, especially as we look at verses 7 through 9, is, do we as present-day believers get to escape all the dangerous times of death and destruction in the tribulation? Uh, that's, that's something that's a, a great question to be asked, because when the world looks in, they think of modern-day English-speaking Christendom as kind of escapist, that uh, because our popular authors, uh, LaHaye and company, have, have uh, kind of popularized prophetic literature, and it just looks like the Christians miss it all. And that, that is truly what unbelievers think of us. Well, the precise, accurate, biblical, and theological way to answer that question truly is yes. That is what the Bible says. It does say in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 that we are not appointed to wrath. And the wrath that's described after chapter 5, verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians 5 is all about the second coming of Christ, the tribulation time, the time the Bible variously describes as the seven years, as the 1260 days, as all these different parts as it talks about the both halves of the tribulation. So precisely, yes. However, if we as believers go through just the normal struggles that many face today outside the English-speaking world and have always faced, it may seem like the tribulation to most of us living in the English-speaking world. Did you catch that? If we just get what the non-English-speaking people are getting, I'm not talking about people that speak English in China, I'm talking about basically the outcroppings of the British Empire, the, you know, the UK and New Zealand and Australia and us and Scotland and Canada. If you get outside of those boundaries, most believers around the world are paying a great price for being believers that, that we at present are not required to pay. In historic perspective, we as Americans are living in a bubble, and I believe that the bubble is already starting to pop around us. You know, regularly when I meet with the elders and the staff, I say, you know, we're a big target here in Kalamazoo. We have the largest Christian facility in this whole area, this building. And can you imagine the immense cost it is to the the state and local government to not tax us at the same rate they would tax this if it was an amusement park or something else. Can you imagine the tougher things get, what it's going to be to have all these huge Christian facilities that that are not, which is going to come out in the news, paying their fair share as we go through this economic slump? Do you realize that very quickly it would be very hard for believers in most Christian ministries to be able to sustain if they are treated as businesses. And, and yet, there's nothing in the Bible that says don't tax Christian churches. It doesn't say don't, don't pay taxes if you're in the ministry and, and have a Christian school or something. You should be exempt. No. It's just an anomaly. We're in a bubble right now. We're in this time where, where the government is favoring us in a way of not extorting from us what they could easily take from us in taxes. Well, are we prepared tonight, and do we have to prepare to face the demonic invasions as Satan rampages through the earth in the tribulation? No. But are you prepared this evening for what most believers alive on earth today and for the last 6,000 years have faced? No, we're probably not, because we're not used to it. For all of the history of earth, for most believers... Life for God has been reduced to three words. Persecution, that was frequent and hostile. Affliction, which was constant and inescapable. And supplication, which was earnestly offered for the protection of loved ones. Most believers, for most of the last 6,000 years, have paid dearly for living for Christ. In fact, Paul said, all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 
Now, for most of us, it's snide comments. It's like saying, yeah, you probably won't stay for the, you know, this part of the party, or you're probably, you know, they, I remember when I went to Haslow High School, the Tony Waldron, the principal there, used to always say, oh, there's the deacon. You know, the deacon. I was in high school. I was a deacon because I didn't linger after football games and get drunk with all the other kids and then go up in the haylofts and do everything they did and brag about it all weekend long. So he called me the deacon. You know, what's interesting is that after I was graduated from Hazlitt High School, I would see that same principal in the years ahead, and he still called me the deacon when I was going through the grocery store. And I thought, so if he needs spiritual help, he'll come to me. But, you know, there, 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 that's... <laughs> That, that's what we should do. We should be known for our testimony in Christ. But you know what? That's about the most persecution that I've had. I don't know about you, but I don't have scars. I haven't been whipped. You know, I haven't been, uh, don't have cigarette burns on me when they're trying to find out where the Bible study is and they're going to, you know, keep torturing us. We just aren't used to that. However, every day there are more voices around Christ's throne in heaven. There are more saints who kneel raising the fragrant worship of praise to God. And there are more redeemed lives who bless the name of their Redeemer. Why? Because worship is rising every day in heaven. Primarily because there are more martyrs that are dying for Christ and have in the last century than in the last 19 centuries combined. Did you catch that? More people have died for Christ in the last 100 years than died in the 1900 years prior to the last century. That's how, how heated it's getting. When you read about the catacombs and Christians being mauled and torn up and, and eaten by the beast and, and the gladiator fights, that was a very small part of human history and a very small geographic place compared to the price that people are paying today all over the world. We're in a bubble. One of the avenues that enlarges worshipers in heaven is through the martyrdom of saints. And that is exactly what Jesus said would be like globally in Matthew 24. If you look down, Jesus says in verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, uh, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. What's interesting, that nation against nation is ethne, ethnic group. And, and we're seeing that type of thing going on. In fact, most of the conflicts nowadays are not so much sovereign, sovereign nations, but the whole concept of ethnic groups within sovereign nations that aren't getting along. And then it says famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places, and all these, verse 8, are the beginning of sorrows. But look at verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now that hasn't quite happened. Christians are not universally hated by all nations everywhere on the face of the earth tonight. We're still accepted. Uh, love. Uh, presidents call in evangelicals for counsel in America. Uh, they still have a, a somewhat state operated Archbishop of Canterbury kind of thing over in England. They still have the Church of Scotland. They still have much of the freedoms in New Zealand and Australia. And, and there is the state church in, in a lot of the Scandinavian countries. There's not universal hatred against believers. But remember that many of Christ's saints are still suffering and dying around the world today. Persecution is as old as God's people. Saints were persecuted in the Old Testament. Remember what it says in Hebrews 11? They were stoned, they were slain, they were wandered around in goatskins and calfskins. They were sun in thunder. So there's always been Old Testament, New Testament persecution. In fact, if you just casually read the book of Acts, those 28 chapters, you know what you come up with? 47 different specific persecution times that are recorded. 47 different accounts of the early church suffering. So persecution is not new. It's old. It's just at the very end, it's absolutely universal. We're not quite there yet. In modern times, with the unstoppable flow of news reports from every corner of the globe via the Internet, there is a growing awareness that worldwide suffering is going on among literally millions of believers who are persecuted just because they're Christians. Now, I remember the years that I delivered Bibles in Eastern Europe and, and preached in churches in Eastern Europe and, and Northern Africa and the Muslim countries. 
It was common knowledge that if you're a Christian, you couldn't go to college. In the whole Soviet bloc, Christians didn't go to college. Because if they went to college, they'd get a degree, and then they might outdo a Communist Party person. So no higher education for Christians. Now, just try that in America. What would you think of that? What would you think if being a Christian would permanently reduce your children to day laborers and hourly workers? They could never be professionals. Well, we would have a a lessening in the visible church in America. That's what they found in Eastern Europe. The people disassociated with the church because they wanted their children to go to college. They wanted them to succeed. They wanted them to be managers. They wanted them to be professionals. And Christians weren't allowed to be under the 70-year rule of communism. They were not allowed to be professionals. There's a great price to pay all over the world. The persecution of economic discrimination is one of the many forms that persecution took in the last hundred years. In fact, last month I was contacted online by a group of Pakistani believers. They sent me an email and, you know, in the the interesting way it comes through, you know, where English isn't quite the way you, it kind of makes you chuckle, if you know what I mean. If you ever get an email from someone that doesn't quite know English to put the words around, that's why I only email in English, because I don't want them to laugh at my French, you know. And so I just use English. And uh, But they communicated from Pakistan to us in English, and they sent me a note, and they said, uh, uh, we like Book Your. And I thought, yeah, I got it so far. And they said, we translate Book Your. And... Uh, and so I wrote back and said, book your what? You know, what, what book your do you want? And they said, oh, can we translate some of the portions of, of the book that I wrote in Revelation? And I said, you certainly can. They says, uh, but you pay us for translate your book your. And I said, oh, oh, you want to be hired for translation? I said, well, we don't have any funding right now to, to translate that into Pakistani. But I said, tell me more about you. I'd love to pray for you. And I have their email. It's just amazing. They, they said that they are followers of Jesus Christ in Pakistan. And that is a land of great persecution against Christ's church. And so I wrote them back. I said, how exactly are you persecuted? And this is what they said. Pakistani believers face many forms of persecution, but one of the foremost is constant financial oppression. Now, is that, you read about that in the news? Financial oppression. Did you know that believers in Pakistan, born again, evangelical believers, are not allowed to own property? They can't own real estate. It's against the Muslim law for them to actually own real estate, property, homes. Now, in some of the outlying areas, but wherever there is the the following of the law, they aren't allowed to own property, especially homes. And this is what they said. Consequently, we must rent from Muslim landlords. And our hostile landlords charge us as believers as much money for rent as they think we can possibly be earning. So we are always short on money and only have just barely enough to live on. Now again, how would you like to not own your home, live in an apartment from someone that tries to calculate how much you have and they change the rent every month? I mean, we wouldn't stand for that. We'd have another 1776 revolution, right? That's how we think. But that's how they live over there. They said, this was the bottom of their their, uh, email, they said, we face hunger, endless labor, and financial insecurities, and that's just some of the daily persecutions and afflictions that your brothers and sisters face in Pakistan. So I wrote them back. I said, what do you want to translate for? They said, because they wouldn't figure out what we were doing. And if you paid us just a minimal amount, like 2 or $3 a day, we would be able to feed our family, and they couldn't figure out where the money came from. I thought, 2 or $3 a day can feed your family? We have it so good over here. Persecution is just one form of what the Bible describes as affliction. Affliction is needed because affliction in our lives was designed by God to be much like the fire of Daniel 3. Do you remember the three Hebrew boys that were made to enter the fiery furnace? By the way, what happened to them? The only thing that got burnt was the bonds that kept them from moving around. Only what bound them was burned away. And then they were able to walk around and fellowship with the Lord who was with them in the furnace. 
I think sometimes we need to reread that story. Because in our lives, affliction and persecution are designed by God to only burn away anything that hinders our walk with Him. So instead of running from it every time we hear about it or see it, we should realize that when God brings affliction, persecution, duress into our lives, it's for His purpose. The biblical perspective as we hold on and see more and more hostility toward biblical Christianity is that the persecutions we see all around the world are just a preview. Look again at Matthew 24. I don't want to bore you, but I want you to see Jesus was predicting the future. And what he says, Jesus describes in verses 4 and 5, we saw this last time, global false teaching. We have that. We have it everywhere. Some of our most notorious false teachers are famous overseas. Uh, they're well known because of the, uh, the media that we have. Then in verse 6, global warfare. America is the largest weapon-making, weapon-distributing, and manufacturing entity in the world. I mean, we contribute more armaments everywhere, and, and it's, part of our, it's part of our economy. Well, that's all building up for verse 6, global warfare. Then verses 7 and 8, and that's where we started last time, it, right in the center, it talks about those pestilences. And then before that, in verse 7, the famines. And there is global famines, epidemics, and earthquakes. And then, verse 9, where we are tonight, there are global persecutions. And even though Christians have always been hated around the world, there's an acceleration, Jesus says, and all, look, look what it says, all, verse 9, all nations. There won't be any havens. You won't be able to go to, you know, where they have religious tolerance in Sweden or, or New Zealand where you can, you know, have your little church. It's just everywhere. And then there's going to be chaos, we saw in verses 10 through 13, and then global evangelism. So Jesus warned us in advance that global persecution is coming. And if it's like every other one of these signs. Jesus said, in the, in the tribulation hour, no one could buy or sell unless they have a number. Can you buy or sell very well without a number? Mm -mm. Now, it's not quite the number of the tribulation that's associated to worshiping the Antichrist, but the buying or selling without a number is here, and it's just happened, and we've accepted it. That's the same with this global persecution. There's going to be increasingly international laws that are against our intolerance of other beliefs. We are exclusivists. We believe there is no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved. We don't think that Jesus was just one of many good prophets. We believe that he is the way, the truth, the life. We're intolerant of many roads going to God. Now, now we're pluralistic. We believe it's okay if you want to be a Buddhist, it's okay if you want to be a Muslim, but you can't go to heaven. See, that's the problem. We take that extra step and declare the gospel that there's only salvation in Christ Jesus. Not just Jesus, the prophet that even the Muslims think was great, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that is unacceptable to them. Well, as we draw near to what appears to be the end of days, we should begin to see the level of persecution rising. And if you consider what most church historians consider, they nearly unanimously observe that more Christians have been killed for their faith in the last century than all the centuries of Christianity combined. And that's what Jesus would call the beginning. Remember, Jesus said these are just the beginnings of birth pangs. If you read Matthew 24, he says this is just the beginning. What we would see is persecution that would get closer and closer together and get more and more intense. That's what all of these trends are about. A recent article in the New York Times stated that there are 11 countries where Christians are currently enduring harsh religious persecution. They listed them off as China, the Sudan, Pakistan, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, Vietnam, Egypt, Nigeria, Cuba, Laos, Uzbekistan, and they said each of those are places where believers, they, they don't quite know our verbiage, but the way they described them as those who believe in Christ Jesus only would suffer greatly. And what's amazing is that Christian persecution is usually based on two political ideologies, communism or militant Islam. So far, nobody else is really heavily bothering us. It's just communism, you know, that's the Cuba, China, Russian satellite states and rising back in Russia, and the 
Islamic uh, menace that's coming. Of course, the New York Times didn't mention Indonesia and Iran, where recently uh, married couples were severely beaten and whipped in their old country by religious police because of faith in Christ. That doesn't even make the New York Times, because that's just local. Uh, They can break in a house and take a stick and beat a Christian and beat them until they need to be hospitalized, but that really doesn't make news. Indeed, Christian persecution sounds like something from the distant past. It conjures up images of early followers of Jesus being thrown to lions or various apostles being crucified or otherwise martyred. For most of us in America, being out of sight of the plight of our brothers and sisters so far away keeps them also out of mind. I mean, we kind of generally think about that. We think, yep, yep, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they're suffering over there. We don't realize that today, today, you know, in India, in Orissa, there's, there, there are people that if they go together together, someone might come and burn the building they're in over their heads. I mean, that's how it is. Today across the world, believers are suffering persecution, and we need to learn to sorrow with them in their sorrow. We need to sacrifice for them who are suffering for Christ's sake. We need regular reminders because we are often so isolated from the world's problems. Even in most of our American churches, we're unaware of the growing hostility toward Christians around the world. If you just, if you just scan the newspaper, you know, or, or even let, let a computer scan it for you, go to Google and just put in your keywords and let Google read all the newspapers in the world and just pull out the ones that have your words in them. If you put Christian, persecution, death, martyrdom, just like a string of four words, this is, this is what you'd get. And these are just some that, that I have ferreted out. In the Middle East, a decade ago, Islamic fundamentalists had an uneasy religious truce with Western expatriates who came to work for them, particularly in the oil-rich nations like Saudi Arabia. They tried to keep the Westerners, mostly Christians, of one degree commitment or another, restricted from the rest of the populace. They just kind of put them in their compounds. But the Islamic world is increasingly a hostile place for Christians. In Saudi Arabia, for instance, Christianity is illegal. Conversion from Islam is punishable by death. In Pakistan, the death penalty is prescribed for anyone who blasphemes Islam, something that occurs immediately in Christian evangelism. When you evangelize, you're blaspheming Islam. So in Pakistan, they can legally kill you, as well as the Saudi Arabia peninsula. In Egypt and elsewhere, Christian girls have acid thrown in their faces by Islamic extremists if they refuse to convert to Islam, or they are raped, or even worse. At best, the most enlightened Islamic societies, Christians as well as Jews, are second-class citizens, have special taxes imposed on them, and don't share the rights of a Muslim. In fact, Christians, Coptic Christians, all have a little tattoo on their wrist in Egypt. And, and those Christian Coptics can only date someone else that has the tattoo on their wrist because the Coptic church is allowed in Egypt, the, the Christian uh, descendants of, of Mark's ministry in Egypt 2,000 years ago. So they tattoo them in the hospital at birth. If you have both Coptic parents, they put a little tattoo on the baby. And that baby can only socialize with another Coptic or else convert to Islam. And if you at all get out of your tattoo zone, then you can be chased through the streets and beaten in the church, I mean, and the police will not interfere. That's enlightened Islamic society. And you can be dragged off into an alley and raped or murdered, and it's considered hands off. Because you are you are one of those heretics because you don't believe in the truth of Allah. In North Africa, the worst horrors seem to be in Sudan. The civil war has been on and off for 50 years between the Arab, Muslim North, and the black, Christian, and animist South. We all know about that. The North has been working toward an Arabization and Islamization of the country by the imposition of Islamic law in the South. Uh, in, they start in 1983, and that smoldering civil war has been going on for 26 years. And the, the 
current toll is about a million and a half people in the last 10 years, and there's famine and warfare and the displacement of millions of people, and that is where some of the most fruitful evangelistic work was done. The Sudan Interior Mission, SIM, for decades, discipled and nurtured countless churches in that area. How about Eastern Asia, as we call the region around China? Uh, In China, the continuing persecution of Christian believers is is well documented. Churches are bulldozed. You can go on YouTube and watch a church getting bulldozed. I mean, with someone's camera phone. I mean, if they find out that there's a church meeting and, and it's not one that's on the radar screen of the West, they just go in and bulldoze it. And they give you a warning, and if you stay in it, they'll bulldoze it with you in it. Because they are not pro any kind of church that is not part of their system. Pastors are arrested, humiliated, and executed. Christians have been threatened and imprisoned. Christians have been beaten to death. They are frequently tortured and imprisoned for year after year with heavy fines, their property confiscated, and they're frequently also taken out of their employment so it it makes their whole family suffer. Economic discrimination. Current reports tell us that house churches, those that are not sanctioned by the totalitarian government in 20 provinces, that 129 people, according to the the Christian groups that tally this, 129 people have been killed in the last few months, 23,000 arrested, 4,000 have been sentenced to re-education. That's just current, what's going on in China. And we watch the Olympics and we think, wow, how did they do that? You know, all the beauty and the graphics. And behind all of that, is a system absolutely opposed to Christ and absolutely opposed to what we so freely, freely enjoy. How about Latin America? Missionaries have been attacked as soft targets by the various structures of the the drug lords and terrorists in particular. Other Christian workers have been kidnapped. We know this. I mean, we've seen it on TV. Read it in our missions magazines. Mission agencies have to adopt a difficult policy. They have learned to refuse to pay ransom. Agency executives agree that giving into the demands only causes more kidnappings. So missionaries going into insecure situations knowing they must rely on God's help and grace. It's the only way that, that missions can go on in many of these parts of Latin America. And that's, that's just three hours south of here, by airplane, four hours. Amazing to think about. How about Africa? Because of their stand for Christian principles of freedom and democracy and because of their untiring work in the name of Christ, on behalf of the poor, oppressed, and persecuted, many Christians have been martyred in political and ethnic conflicts. There are many incidents in Rwanda, Burundi, South Africa, where missionaries, pastors, churches, and and all types of Christian organizations have been specifically targeted. In Rwanda's genocide alone, half a million Christians were martyred. Do you know who they were? The descendants of C.T. Studd's work. C.T. Studd, one of the greatest missionaries of modern times who died in 1931, left behind 20,000 converted evangelists that went into all of the heart of Africa with the gospel, planting churches. And that is where Rwanda and that whole genocide is going on. And so many of those people that are being macheted to death, hacked, are actual brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's going on today. But they're not out of God's mind. In fact, I'd like to show you what the good news is. Go back to Revelation 5, and I want to show you something. Revelation 5 reminds us that these martyrs are not out of God's God's mind. The persecution and martyrdom of believers is a great part of the focus of our God in heaven. Each day there are more voices in heaven praising God, and many of them are coming by way of severe persecution. Think about the saints in heaven. Think about those who are being macheted to death or being beaten by a mob and killed and being uh, burnt to death or whatever, like, like... 10 years ago, 10 years ago right now, the, the sweet American father and, and the missionary in India was burned alive in his car with his kids for preaching in a Hindu village. That was just 10 years ago. Same time the Columbine massacre was going on. Within a few weeks, both of those events occurred. From Stephen, the first martyr in Christ church onward, these faithful unto death servants ascend to heaven And just as in Acts 7.55, I believe Jesus stands up to welcome each of them. 
Remember when Stephen was dying? And, and they were pulverizing him as, as Saul was watching and standing there as a witness. And do you remember that Stephen looked up and he saw Jesus standing? Remember where Jesus said he's going to be seated at the Father's right hand? Did you know he stands to receive martyrs? Isn't that amazing to think about? So Jesus is standing as he watches these faithful witnesses join the saints in circling the throne as they kneel before Christ and offer him their worship. For just a moment, starting in verse 9 of chapter 5 of Revelation, what exactly is the worship that's offered by these faithful saints in heaven? When they finally get to see Jesus face to face, what do we hear them over and over repeating? What, what, when you finally get to be there, what's the content? What is it that, that they're so excited to share with the Lord? Well, verse 9, they have thank offerings. It's the fruit of their lips as they praise Christ. And it says in verse 9, they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And keep going over to chapter 7, just across the page. Look at verse 10. This is, by the time we get to chapter 7, we're having all these coming out of the multitudes of the great tribulation. These are heavy-duty martyrs coming from this big bloodbath, the the one that that Matthew 24 promises is going to happen. And they are standing there, these martyrs, in verse 9, it identifies them. But look what they say in verse 10. And crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Those in heaven both those who are there through natural means and those who are flooding it through martyrdom, often thank God for Christ as their Redeemer. They call Him the author of their salvation. And they say with their voices that God saved them, that God redeemed them, that God washed them, that God cleansed them. Now let me ask you, that's what the redeemed are doing constantly right now in heaven. They're saying, thank you for washing, thank you for redeeming, thank you for saving, thank you for cleansing, thank you for shedding your blood. That's what they're constantly saying with their own voices. Let me just ask you, is that something that's regularly a part of our voice usage? Do we regularly testify that he loved me, that he loosed me from my sins, that he saved me, that he washed me, he gave himself for me, as Paul said in in Galatians 2.20? Is that a regular part? In fact, you might ask yourself, when is the last time you actually told someone out loud with your own voice how God saved you? Now turn back to Hebrews 13 with me. Uh, Hebrews is the big book with 13 chapters. If you just back up from Revelation through the little books, you'll come into the big one, Hebrews chapter 13. And I want to show you something in verse 15, because we can offer continuous worship offerings that rise to God. And here's how we do it. When with our own voice, we praise Him. And it says in Hebrews 13 and verse 15, Therefore, by Him, let us, here it is, continually Offer the sacrifice of praise to God. And what is that? That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks. And that word giving literally is the same word for confess. If we confess our sins, you ever heard it means homo legao, it's the Greek word, and it, it means to say the same thing. It's, that's what we're talking about. This word is the word confess. And we say the same thing with thanksgiving for his name. What are we saying? What is the single greatest gift we should keep praising God and thanking him for? Yes, our salvation, that he purchased us, that he washed away our sins, that that is the simplest, greatest offering we can give. That's what we're going to be doing forever in heaven. We are the ones who are the confessing church. We're confessing that he loved us, that he loosed us from our sins, that he actually became sin for us. My sin is on him. His righteousness is on me. And so the simple worship, of proclaiming Christ is one of the greatest offerings we can give. It's what God wants us to give Him forever. 
Did you know forever we're going to be saying over and over, thank you for washing me of my sin. Thank you for being the, the lamb that was slain. Thank you for being my redeemer. Thank you for buying me with your own blood. That is going to be so much filling our hearts. We're with so much gratitude that we're in heaven that we just can't stop saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, this is Sunday night. So this, this isn't the visitor time when everybody reading the newspaper comes by and they want to see what's on the sign. They come in. So this is pretty much believers, right? So I thought about it. For just a moment, let me ask you, just sit there and think about this. How many of you at this very moment know that your sins are forgiven, that Jesus Christ died in your place, and that right now you possess eternal life? Now just think about it. You know that, right? Inside. You believe that. You're confessing Christians. In other words, you know you are a born-again believer. You know that you're saved by the grace of God, not by any works of righteousness that you could ever do. So did you know that God loves you to proclaim that to him? So I thought we'd do a little practice here, okay? Did you know they they, uh, started doing this in youth conferences? Do you know how they're starting to give the invitation in youth conferences? Because of our post-Christian world we're in? In youth conferences, if you want to come to Christ, they don't make you come forward, and they don't make you raise your hand with everyone's head down. They they just have the people that, that come to Christ stand up and cry out to him right there where they're sitting. Well, they don't have very many people converted because people aren't willing to do that. So we're not, not giving an invitation tonight, but do you know what you can do tonight? You could silently proclaim Jesus Christ and declare that you know him by just testifying of that, by standing up. So this is what I'm going to ask you to do, okay? If you really know you're born again tonight, why don't you just silently stand up as a declaration of that, okay? Now some are sleeping, so bump them. I don't want any... <laughs> don't pass out tracks to the to people that are sleeping. Now think about this. You have silently proclaimed you belong to Christ. Now think about this. What if I was standing up here with an AK-47 and a green bandana on that says Hamas or Hezbollah? And all of my buddies had them slung over their shoulders, and they were going to ferret out the infidels from the true followers of Allah. Would you stand up so readily? Think about that. See, we're not at that point. Now, you may be seated. I don't want anybody to get... We're not bringing out the machine guns, and I'm not going to scare you or anything else, okay? Think about this. The simple act of distilling your testimony of salvation down to a short, simple declaration of what God has done in your life is a very major part of our worship to the Lord. We, sometimes we don't think about this. We don't think that the content of the redeemed in heaven is they just have simply reduced down to a few words that Jesus loved them, that he bought them, that he paid the price of their sins, that he shed his blood, that he is their redeemer, that he is the lamb that was slaughtered. Slain in Greek means slaughtered. It's very graphic. Jesus was slaughtered for our sins. And, and they don't go on and on with four-hour-long testimonies. They just have reduced it down to the essence. That's what we're doing forever in heaven. Learning to worship our Redeemer by declaring in a short, concise way His substitutionary atonement. Now, I have a simple request for each of you who stood. So that's everybody, okay? All of you stood. And that is that because you're redeemed by Christ's blood, how about taking a few minutes this week and write down on a small piece of paper, a three-by-five card, type it in your computer, something, your salvation testimony and whittle it down to 30 seconds or less. You should have one short enough that if you're on one of these airplanes, you know, what were they called, bombardiers, that just crashed in Buffalo, was it? You know, we have ice. I know it's warming up, but it might come back. And if you're on one of those bombardiers and the pilot says, we're experiencing some uh, trouble here, don't know what's going to happen, do you know what you should do? 
Yeah, just have that 30-second testimony ready and turn to the person on this side and say, Hey, Jesus Christ loved me and loosed me from my sins. He is the Lamb that redeemed me from all, all the penalty of my sin. And I know if this plane smashes some house in Buffalo and bursts into flames, did you read the report of that? The neighbors saw the people in the plane. It hit like that, and it just sat there. And then it went, and just, just like that, just exploded in flames, and no one got out. Did you know we should be ready? Don't wait till a plane crashes. You can say it in an elevator. You can say it at school. That's why Tony Waldron at Hazlitt, I don't think he's still alive, that's why he called me the deacon, because I shared the gospel with him. And the only thing you could think of in the Catholic Church is only deacons. You're not a priest. He could tell that, but he said you must be a deacon or something in the Catholic Church because you, you're so vo- vocal in your evangelistic work. Writing down your testimony... You don't have to have an exact date. You don't need to go into flowery details. The essence is what God did. See, that's what the essence of a testimony is not me. It's what God did. It says in Jonah 2.9, salvation is of the Lord. So what did God do in your heart and life? Not what you did. In fact, I sat down at my computer, and I took five minutes, and I, I just kept typing my testimony down and using the word count thing, you know, because I knew I had to, I know the speed I talk, so do you, you know, and I know exactly how many words I speak. So I knew I had to get, to get 30 seconds, I speak 87 words every 30 seconds when I'm just talking normal talk. And so I had to get down what God did into 87 words. And it took me five minutes to reduce it to 87 words. And this is what I wrote. This is my 30 second testimony. I praise God for saving me from my sin. I first heard the gospel with my heart in 1962. Before then, I feared only the consequences of getting caught. But on that November day, I first heard God, knowing my sin was against him. At that moment, I knelt, confessing my sins, asking for his gracious promise, forgiveness, and cleansing. And from that moment, 46 years ago, he took all my sins on himself and moved to live within, never to leave or forsake me. 87 words. Could you share in 30 seconds how you came to know Christ? You don't have to have November. You can say, I was 12. You can say, I was 6. I was at VBS. I was at home. I was in a storm. I, I was in the military. I, I thought that the ship was sinking. I mean, doesn't I thought you know that I was dying or whatever. But I would encourage each of you who are born again and know Christ to make these next few weeks... A time of offering and listening to offerings of praise to the Lamb, our Redeemer. I mean, we're leading up. By the way, Easter's coming. Can you imagine the joy it would be at Easter dinner, not to just sit around and have all that food, but to have every member of your family share audibly their testimony? You might even get a little exotic on this. Did you know we celebrate two birthdays for everybody in our family? We celebrate the, the day they were born of the flesh, and then we celebrate the day they were born of the Spirit their spiritual birthday. And do you know what the person that's being honored gets to do? They get to share their testimony with the whole family, how they got saved. Isn't it wonderful to think that the greatest possession we have is our eternal life and that we should let the Redeemer of the Lord say so? We should talk about it, share it. Each time we all do that, we get a small taste of what heaven will be like forever for all of us as we join the redeemed, telling Christ our Redeemer thanks over and over and over for our salvation. And so we need to be those who respond to Christ with thanksgiving. Let me just finish up by taking it to Matthew 5. And I want to, this is how we're going to roll into next time. Because I only said this because someone last week said, are you sure that you should make everyone think we're going to miss everything? And by the way, I will comment on that. I'm... I think that we also need to not only be not naive about persecution, but if you've ever lived in any other parts of the country that have regular disasters, did you know it's normal to prepare for disasters? We lived in California. Governor Schwarzenegger, we knew him before he was the governor. Arnie, he used to eat at the same restaurant we ate at. And and when he became the governor and Gray Davis before him and everybody else, did you know that everybody in California is supposed to be prepared for earthquakes? Did you know we all had our little box in the trunk? 
I mean, a few people were disobedient, but almost everybody has a box, just kind of like a bank box in their trunk, and you have enough stuff to last for two days if the bridges all collapse during an earthquake and you're in your car, because most people live in their cars. You drive all the time to work and all over the city. And so the government says everybody should have their earthquake box, and you, you have your blankets because you're going to have sleep in the car, you're going to have your water, you're going to have your food, you have your flashlight, and you have your emergency contact plan. And that's just how life in California is. And everybody has two days of water and food and their little blanket and their little contact thing and their plan with their family and relatives that there's an earthquake, how we'll get in touch. And that's just life. Is it doomsday? No, it's just life. There are earthquakes all the time. And every house, you have in your trunk, you have your one or two day thing. And every house, you're supposed to have enough for two weeks. Because when there's earthquakes, it ruptures the gas lines, it ruptures the water lines, it ruptures the electric lines, it knocks out your bank, it knocks out Ralph's supermarket, it knocks out everything. And so everybody in California is supposed to be ready, in Los Angeles County, at least, in Orange County, for a one- or two-day stint in your car and a one- or two-week stint in your house if it didn't fall. Did you know that, that, that that's just common sense? Don't think that from here until the Lord sweeps us into his presence that the electricity is going to work every day, that, that Myers and Walmart are going to have food on the shelves every day. I mean, it's just common sense to know that what is happening in our world, there are ramifications to it. Remember the first thing they told me when we moved here? They said, well, gas prices are more in Oklahoma because we're at the end of the line of the gas pipeline. Do you know what that means if something happens at the other end of the gas pipeline? If we're at the other end of the line? Just prudence. I think as Christians we should be wise. Not doomsday. Don't move out in the woods and dig a hole and put your money and your wheat in there and run with your gun and hide there. The purpose in disaster is for us to be light. In fact, you should have extra food so you can invite everybody in your neighborhood that was so dumb and doesn't have any over. And just say, hey, all of you sit down while we eat. I'm going to read the Bible. In fact, I'll share my 30-second testimony, okay? I mean, it, the purpose for this is to be redemptive, not to be, I'm going to get all my stuff. But I remember many times in, in California where I remember when First Interstate Bank, none of the ATMs worked. Uh, for several days. And they just said, you should, have, you should have enough. They said, when the electricity and all the stuff and the computers get shaken, the, the ATMs don't work. They said, you should just plan. So we should. But what, that has nothing to do with, you know, that, I was just saying that because someone said, do we all have our head in the hole? No, we don't. We don't have our head in the hole. You guys should have your earthquake box and whatever. Do something. But look at chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, because what is the biblical response God wants us to make with the persecution coming? Number one, in Matthew 5, verses 44 and 45, number one, we should love and pray for any, anyone who is persecuting believers. Okay? You know, we, we forget this. Look what Jesus said. But I say to you, Matthew 5, 44 and 45, love your enemies. Okay, can you repeat that? Everyone repeat that out loud with me. Love your enemies. Now, it's easier said than done. For a second, sit there and think. Do you have any enemies? Do you have anybody that is an enemy at school, at work, a neighbor that is just adversarial? Love your enemies. Number two, look what he says in verse 40, 44, continuing. Bless those who curse you. Now, we might not be to the point where they're doing that yet, but let's get ready for it, okay? Because sooner or later, they're going to say to us what a long time ago we heard when we lived in New England. You know what they used to say to us? You shouldn't have that many kids. You're using more than your fair share of the resources. They, they, they were like that in, in other parts of the country, too. They say... You shouldn't have so many kids. You sh you're, you're overpopulating the world. Even though it's God that says be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, they, they said, oh, no, no, we've got to protect. Did you see that sign, Chief Somebody? There's a sign on 94. You, the earth doesn't belong to you. You belong to the earth. No. Chief, whoever that is, no, no. The earth belongs to God, and I belong to God. I don't belong to the earth. You know, that's an earth dweller. But we're going to be cursed. Look at this. Bless, what does it say? Bless those who curse 
you. Why was it that the people that put the shackles on Paul's wrists and feet ended up becoming the most fervent believers in Caesar's household? Because Paul blessed those who cursed him. So Jesus said, love your enemies. We repeated that. He said, secondly, bless those who curse you. Let's repeat that together, okay? Bless those who curse you. Now, if someone curses you at work, I mean, they haul off and say, you blankety, blankety, blank, say, I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. It's okay to be that charismatic, okay? It's okay. We should do that. We should respond to curses with blessing. Look what else Jesus says. Do good to those who hate you. You might be in some adversarial relationship with uh, child custody or, or with, I don't know what, with someone that, that maybe you're not you know, able to make your payments to right now. Do you know what this says? Do good to those who hate you. We go out of our way. See, this is, this is why the early church swept the ancient Roman Empire. Because they, they took Jesus literally. I mean, if Jesus said this is the biblical response to love your enemies and bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you, and look at this, this is what we're getting down to. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That means you should be praying for the militant, fundamentalist Islamic entities in this world, because if they could get near you, they would despitefully use you. They would. We should be praying for them. Not that they go to hell, but that they come to Christ. Did you know that, that I think in March, uh, one of the great Muslim evangelists is coming through town, coming to Western Michigan University, saved right out of a terrorist training camp. I mean, it, there is great ministry among Muslims. If we bless, love, pray for, and, and what does that do? Verse 45, Then will be sons of our Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rains on the just and the unjust. By the way, that's right now. In Isaiah, he changes that. If they don't come in, during the millennium to the temple, he doesn't let the rain fall on them. See, God's going to change his treatment of these. But right now under grace, he's, he's long-suffering and, and, you know, raining on even those that hate him. But he won't in the future. One more, and then we have to go. Look at Acts 12.5. Acts 12.5. And this is, uh, someone said to me, they said, well, you're, you're starting, you keep, you keep recruiting these people with this prayer thing. What would we pray for? Well, Acts 12.5 says one thing we could pray for, which is our duty as a church, uh, not only to pray for those who are persecuting us around the world, but Acts 12.5, look what it says. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. Look at this. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Did you know we are together to pray for believers we know are being persecuted? Or actually, that's, did you know that's just like sitting in here and taking notes? It's just as important. For the church together to pray for those that they know are being persecuted? D did you know that there are whole organizations that, that, that actually present ways to pray for those who are being persecuted? I mean, we have a great big map in our house of, of all the persecuted places, and, and there, there are many of these. Right in, in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, is, is where one of the, the big organizations is, where, where we can learn how to pray for those who are persecuted. What's the biblical response God says is supposed to be on our heart for persecution coming? We should love and pray for anyone that's persecuting believers, and we should pray for believers we know are being persecuted. And we shouldn't be saying, hey, I'm going to miss all that. I'm getting out of here before it all comes. No, I'm in it now. I'm in a bubble. So are you. I can own property. I can go to higher education. I just told the staff I was in school continuously from 1962 to 1999. I was in school for 37 years. I'm so thankful for America. Aren't you? We're in a bubble. Let's make the most of our bubble. Let's pray for those that are persecuted. Let's, let's pray for Christians who are being persecuted and for their persecutors. 
And let's prepare for hard times because just like the number buying and selling thing is already here, the persecution thing's coming. And when it comes, some people are going to think they missed the rapture. And actually, all they're doing is catching up with what most people have experienced for all the history of the world. Let's be those who often share our testimony. Write it down this week. Why don't you make it a goal between now and Easter to have your testimony written out and at Easter dinner say, hey, or even before, let's all share Christ. Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege we have a few moments ago to stand and say we belong to you. Right now to stand and say, Lord, I want to get ready. I want to get ready for what's coming. Far before you meet us in the clouds, all who are godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. And that persecution is un unknown to the majority of us here tonight. So I pray that you prepare our hearts and that you would prepare us by learning to bless those that persecute us and pray for those who despitefully use us and that we would start learning to be constantly in prayer for brothers and sisters we know that are being horribly mistreated and then as we feel with them we will begin changing and our grip on this world will lighten and loosen and our grip on heaven will be strengthened. I pray that you'd prepare us for being the redeemed around your throne. You'd prepare us by reducing down our testimony to something we can share and learning to share it. And may we as a fellowship of believers be quick to tell one another how thankful we are that our sins are gone and that we belong to you. And I pray we become more aware of what's going on around this world and that we would suffer with those that suffer. We'd sorrow with those that sorrow and that we would bear one another's burdens, especially those tens of thousands and millions that are suffering greatly tonight, who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask that by your grace and the power of your Spirit and for your glory. And all God's people said, Amen.